Okay, social psychology, the research methods. You can see really that the focus within the social psychology for the research methods is qualitative and quantitative data, linking this to open and closed questions and how this would be used within surveys, interviews and questionnaires. Now, firstly, surveys is the overarching name for questionnaires and interviews. And surveys are always planned with an aim in mind. So what is it trying to do? So it might be to find out attitudes about prejudice. Uh, and this should always be summed up in a general statement. Now, surveys are commonly used within social psychology. Um, and like I just said, is used as a term for questionnaires and interviews. Now, all three of those, if you see them as, as three, will always gain self-report data. So there's a, an umbrella just to indicate to you that surveys, the forms of surveys, are questionnaires and interviews. They are both a type of survey. Now, self-report data is data that's compiled by the participant about themselves and usually through a written questionnaire. Now, think about the problems that may ar might arise from using self-report data. Participants might lie, they might be dishonest, particularly if you're asking them about something like racism or prejudice. You know, are, are they prejudiced against a different type of group? Now, social desirability, their desire to get it right socially, might mean that they say, no, no, of course I'm not, and actually that's not true. Or people might not understand the question that you're asking them in the first place and therefore not give you a correct answer. Now, gathering data using your surveys. Now, Interviews are often done face to face or you know, potentially over the phone, but often face to face where you're asking participants a question and you're recording their answer. A questionnaire is often a written set of questions which require participants to write their responses and send back to you. Now, both of these questions, a lot of these surveys allow you to use open or closed questions. Now, an open question is one that can be answered in any way the participant chooses, and that gains qualitative, so quality, data, in-depth, rich and data. A closed question is one that limits the response that can be made, so a yes, no answer, and that will give you quantitative, which is numerical data. It's really important that you remember open questions will always gain qualitative data and closed questions will always gain quantitative data. Now, if you look at the question, why did you study psychology? This is obviously an open question because I'm asking you for your opinion. I'm asking why you studied psychology. It doesn't restrict your answer. You can answer this in any way that you want to. Now, I'm warning you about this. On the exam before previously, it's been seen that this could actually be a 12 marker where you're asked about quantitative and qualitative data where you've got to explain what they are, but also compare them and evaluate them in terms of strengths and weaknesses. Now, if we move on to interviews, interviews will come in three forms. We can have an unstructured interview, a structured interview, or a semi-structured interview. So, interviews will mainly gather qualitative data, so in-depth, rich data about the participants. Now, they will include some quantitative data, you know, what's, what's your age? Um, are you happy for me to keep your data confidential? Yes, no. Um, do you go to OSMA 6 form? Yes, no. So, they will have some quantitative data in there. Now, the more structured an interview is, the more likely it is to include quantitative data. You might be asking very straightforward questions with yes, no answers. The less structured an interview is, the more likely it is to gain qualitative data. And often, if you think about it, this allows you to ask why, which is obviously an open question, gaining qualitative data. Now, it's important if the essay question or a question within the exam is asking you to plan an interview that you consider the interview schedule. So what type of questions, how long are you going to allocate for each question, how are you going to record the interview and how are you going to transcribe the interview? And that might mean that you type it up. Now, subjectivity and objectivity play a part here. Now, subjectivity is where the researcher may cause a bias within the results in the sense that they're interpreting it, they're analysing it, and that might be influ influenced by their own views. So if a, a, an examiner or a examiner, it, if a researcher is trying to prove something, then they might use something, um, might use the bits of the data that they can that support the theory that it is that they're trying to prove. Now, objectivity is where there is no bias at all. So this is very scientific. Lab experiments are often quite objective. Now, if we're evaluating interviews, it's important to think about the strengths. Now, strength of an interview can enable us to get a large amount of data collected. Now, this can be really descriptive, really in-depth and detailed, which is obviously more valid. Interviews give us access to information which might not be available through direct observation. So they allow us to study different aspects of behaviour that we might not be able to observe or experiment on, which again makes it a valid method. Interviews can also gather a lot of information which presumes produce results and give us insight into areas that we might not have thought possible before. 
Now, don't forget when you're talking about these evaluation points that you pee them. You make a point, you explain it, and you elaborate or you use evidence to support what you're saying. Weaknesses of interviews is people often don't know what they feel or what they do and therefore are forced to rely on social desirability, which means that they tend to answer the question the way that they think is the right answer. Uh, and this is social desirability, which is a form of bias because it reduces the reliability of the results. Now, in an interview, the analysis can be subjective. We just talked about that. The, the researchers' um, opinions can influence the results. Now, again, another previous exam question where you're being asked to compare qualitative and quantitative data and argue why one is better than the other. The exam tends to do this as a comparison rather than just a straightforward what is qualitative and what is quantitative data. So be warned. The question is... Now, if we're evaluating interviews, it's important to think about the strengths. Now, strength of an interview. Now, an example of when this has been used is Adorno et al. in 1950. Now, they used a questionnaire to see if authoritarian personality can be linked to prejudice. And from this, they developed a fascism scale. Now, they found that people who were more fascist had more prejudiced views. Now, subjectivity and objectivity play a part here. Now, subjectivity is where the researcher may cause a bias within the results in the sense that they're interpreting it, they're analysing it, and that might be influ influenced by their own views. So if a, a, an examiner or... A now, the types of scales, again, we just talked about Likert scale. This might be where participants have to rate their answer to something. So, for example, on a scale of 1 to 5, 1 being strongly agree, 5 being strongly disagree. They might have to use a rating scale where they rate their opinion on something or an identification scale. Now, again, strengths of a questionnaire is that it's a standardised procedure. If we're using the same questions the, same, the whole way through and every participant is answering the same questions, this is a standardised procedure. So there's little variation, which means it's much more realistic, much more valid. By using set procedures, the questionnaires can be easily replicated. Now, if we can replicate something, if we can repeat it, then it is reliable. Now, if we're evaluating interviews, it's important to think about the strengths. Now, strength of an interview can enable us to get a large amount of data collected. Now, this can be really descriptive, really in-depth and detailed, which is obviously more valid. Interviews give us access to information which might not be available through direct observation, so they allow us to study different aspects of behaviour that we might not be able to observe or experiment on, which again makes it a valid method. Interviews can also gather a lot of information which presumes produce results and now again I'm just showing you some exam questions been used now an example of when this has been used is Adorno et al in 1950 now they used a questionnaire to see if authoritarian personality can be linked to prejudice and from this they developed a fascism scale now they found that people who were more fascist had more prejudiced views Now, again, when designing questionnaires or interviews, if you're asked a question within this in the exam, you need to consider the wording of the question, which is more appropriate, a questionnaire or an interview, open or closed questions, and what sample to use. Now, reliability, we've talked about a lot already, is this idea that if we replicate something, would we expect to get the same results? And if we would, then we say that something is reliable. Validity refers to whether something measures what it is supposed to measure. If we're asking a question about um, obedience, but we start asking, do they know how to tie their shoes, then that's obviously not a valid question. Subjectivity and objectivity we've mentioned previously, but subjectivity is where something may be influenced by the researcher and their perspective, and objective is when something is unaltered by any biases. It's much more scientific. Now, for the higher marks within the exam, you need to not just refer to this reliable or, va or valid. You need to be able to talk about different types of reliability and different types of validity. Now, these are all in your booklet, and you made me a big A3 sheet with all information on this on that you need to revise. Now, interviews tend to be more valid, and questionnaires are more reliable. That's a good point. 
Okay, moving on. What is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a precise and testable statement of the relationship between two variables, the IV and the DV. So it's a statement about what is being tested and what things are being measured. Now, the IV and the DV. The IV is the independent variable, and this is always manipulated in an experiment. This is always what's going to be changed. Whereas the DV is the dependent variable, and this is what's measured. Now, we can remember this through Ivy, the old woman that's often manipulated, and then her grandchildren are measuring what they can get from their granny. When we talk about operationalizing variables, we are literally talking about narrowing them down. So, for example, I wouldn't go out and say I'm going to go and measure obedience levels, just like Milgram didn't. What he actually did was his dependent variable was the number of volts given on the electric shock. That is him narrowing down how he's going to measure obedience. And this is what operationalizing does, allows you to measure it accurately. Now we've got alternate and experimental hypothesis. This is something that we write when we expect that there will be a difference. Now it's worth noticing that an experimental hypothesis and alternate hypothesis are exactly the same thing. It's called an experimental hypothesis when we're using it in relation to an experiment. Whereas when we're talking about surveys and interviews, we would call it the alternate hypothesis. This is suggesting that the IV will have a chance, an effect on the DV and that this will not be down to chance. Whereas the null hypothesis is the exact opposite. Remember, null is no. The null hypothesis suggests that there will be no difference. The IV will have no effect on the DV at all. Now, if we're getting our terminology correct here, when there is a difference, we talk about the fact that we reject the null and we accept the alternate hypothesis because there was a difference. If there is no significant difference, then we reject the alternate hypothesis and we accept the null hypothesis. Now, I keep using this word significant, and this is really important. You must talk about this when you're referencing your hypotheses and your um, null and experimental hypothesis. We talk about this later with inferential statistics and probability of significance, but you must make sure that that significant word is in there. Now, we've got different types of hypothesis. We've got directional and non-directional hypothesis. Now, a directional hypothesis is also called a one-tailed hypothesis, and this means that it tells you the direction the fish is swimming in. It tells you the direction or the effect that the IV will have on the DV. So anything that says girls will be more obedient than boys or something like that is, would be a directional hypothesis as opposed to a non-directional or a two-tailed hypothesis. For example, you can't see which way this, the fish is swimming. Now, this predicts that there will be a difference, but it doesn't say what there is. So an example of this might be that there will be a difference between obedience levels between boys and girls, but it doesn't say who will be more obedient, the boy or the girl.